Hello, everyone. Well, we have an exciting meeting for you tonight. Let's start the program. Okay. Every, the speakers will be speaking for um, 10 to 15 minutes. There will probably be time for about one or two questions uh, after each speaker, but we can have many more uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, particularly if we keep things short. But I'm sure there's a lot to hear from all of the damage and interesting stuff that has been happening due to these storms. So without further ado, uh, we'll start with Joseph Roth Lutner uh, from the, the gardens at Golden Gate Park. So that's uh, San Francisco Botanic Garden, uh, the Japanese Tea Garden, and the Conservatory. So, take it away, Joseph. All right. Um, well, thank you, Bart and uh, Ellen, for um, whoever is advancing my slides. Um, but uh, I guess uh, Bart did a great job at setting us up. In case you haven't heard of what the Gardens of Golden Gate Park is, um, we are the Three Gardens, San Francisco Botanical Garden, Conservatory of Flowers, and the Japanese Tea Garden. We officially merged um, starting July uh, this past summer. So um, I just wanted to, to remind everybody, I guess, back in 1995, when we had some similar winds that came through the park. Um, so the Conservatory of Flowers, uh, this is what it looked like in 1995. But luckily, this is what it looks like today. Um, we actually uh, didn't have any damage at the conservatory. Um, when they were rebuilding it, uh, they retrofitted not only for seismic, but also to try to protect the glass uh, for future events. Um, just to remind everybody, we do every so often do a maintenance closure at the conservatory to bring in the trades, the plumbers, the electricians, the carpenters. And um, because of the restricted space in there, we just don't have space for our guests to be in there while we're doing that type of work. Um, so the conservatory is actually closed currently, but will reopen at the end of the month. So the Japanese tea garden, we fared really well. Um, there wasn't any substantial damage. We just renovated our pagoda uh, in the Japanese tea garden. Uh, we just recently re renovated our pagoda. It's absolutely beautiful. And we are renovating the landscape around it with a, a beautiful new plaza de designed by Hoichi Karisu, um, a famous Japanese garden designer. And uh, we're hoping to kick that off uh, by the end of the month. So then over at the Botanical Garden, um, this is actually where we saw most of the damage. Um, we did some temporary flooding throughout the garden. Um, the picture on the right, that is our reservoir and it's one of the lowest points and we pumped the water back up to Stowe Lake. Um, that was well over its uh, the lip of the reservoir um, flooding the surrounding gardens. Uh, our magnolias, uh, we're getting ready for magnolia season. Our first wave of blooms on the Camp Bell um, magnolias, uh, they took a pounding, um, but we had some fresh buds that were still opening up today. Uh, so we're hopefully gonna make it through uh, mostly unscathed on that front as long as the wind and the rain um, calms down for a little bit. But uh, we did have a, a so this is just our green waste. Um, it was overflowing with all of the debris from us working on cleaning stuff up. Um, mostly caused by Monterey cypress uh, dropping some big limbs. We had a handful of trees come down as well. Um, this beautiful big Monterey cypress came down. Um, it was a golden one that was planted uh, at some point, probably in the 40s or 50s. Um, big, beautiful tree. Uh, it was a good exercise though for people to actually see what root structures on trees look like. It's kind of a neat model. Three really big eucalyptus that came down in the garden as well they just kind of started falling like dominoes when one went down, another went down, and then another went down um, as they kind of were losing the ability to shelter each other. Two of them hit collections. One was uh, our dry Mexico collection, and then the other was our succulent garden. So as we're kind of working on cleaning up, uh, we're going to add in the collection. Um, it's too early to tell at this point. So here you can see, I mean, this is just one limb, but it's um, bigger around than my torso. I mean, it was, they were some big trees. Um, here it hit a xanthorea, kind of blew it apart. Um, a whole bunch of uh, tree aloe or um, aloe arborescens, which is kind of a shame because they're looking great right now. They're putting off their, their floral show. 
uh, we had a redwood come down and this one was really surprising to me um, because it's deep in our grove. Um, it should have been pretty well sheltered from the other trees around it, but it just out of nowhere came down, took out a couple of benches on the way. Um, this is one of our more popular wedding spots in the garden. So for the time being, we're kind of letting people know that they might need to find another spot in the garden to get married. And that's it. Um, that was just my, my little brain dump on this last slide as I was trying to put this uh, slide together. So thank you guys. Thanks, Jill. I, I wondered how they, how you protected the conservatory of flowers, the glass. Yeah, so um, when they retrofitted the building, uh, they ended up using a laminated glass. So it's almost got um, like a sticky layer of plastic on each side of it, um, or like a film. So when the, when the glass breaks, it uh, holds itself together. Um, but also I think it just helps to kind of make it a little bit more sturdy. Um, overall, um, we've had people climbing on top of the conservatory and doing all kinds of things that people shouldn't be doing. You'll see footprints up there uh, in the whitewash. And uh, when they break panes, somehow they miraculously stay mostly in place. It seems like a great opportunity to revamp the portions of the garden when it gets wiped out, huh? Unfortunately, yeah. you lose some prized plants though. Yeah, our succulent garden, I'm really excited about doing some rebuilding in there. We got a lot of potential. Just one quick question. If uh, the garden now now joined, if you join the botanical garden, does that give you admission to all three places? It does. Um, and I should also note that uh, San Franciscans are free at all three gardens, um, as well as veterans, regardless of residency. Thank you. That's an incentive to rejoin. <laughs> Okie doke. Awesome. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. And our next speaker will be Andy Stone. Uh, many of you in Cal Hort should all know Andy because he's one of our board members. And again, he works Andy. in Golden Gate Park and will be joining us to talk about some other things within Golden Gate Park that are happening. Welcome, Andy. Well, hello. It's uh, very nice, <clears throat> very nice to speak to everyone. The uh, pictures, I don't have them organized in the most wonderful arrangement. A lot of the damage to the park, some of it is just very temporary, like this flooding, this uh, lovely reflection. It looks kind of like France. But the part of the garden I take care of is uh, Stowe Lake. The picture on the right uh, shows a path that some Boy Scouts built for me uh, going down the steep slope of Strawberry Hill in the middle of Stowe Lake. And a, monster uh, Monterey pine uh, just snapped off a little bit of its left and just landed in the middle of the trail and I'll have to get another well probably another two or three troops of Boy Scouts or actually Sea Scouts to build and rebuild the trail. Uh, there's lots of damage. Let's look at some more slides. I, I didn't get very many in the... Where's the flooding there? Is that going under the so Where that is, is right next to the conservatory of its uh, it's the bridge that goes under JFK, uh, just next to the De Young Museum. So it's a walking path. It, it's the walking path. It's one of the bridges that goes uh, from the from the uh, the Spreckles uh, Bandshell area. There's a goes goes under that bridge, and just on the other side, there's a little playground. But it's right on uh, on Kennedy Drive near the de young museum right on top of that bridge on sundays they have lindy in the park people come and and teach people how to dance and dance for a couple hours i think 10 till 12 o'clock quite nice this spot where we're looking on the right ah so this is uh this one is metzen lake and there's a number of those big huge cypress trees that fell down across across Stowe Lake and and even so they continue to rent boats there were lots of people paddling around the lake but they can't go all the way around the island because it's blocked on one side by a couple of cypress trees that, that are crossing the lake and it'll take us a little while to get them taken out of the out of the lake this this problem with cypress trees they're 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 really old they're they're really big and they go over from time to time. We actually had a person killed in Golden Gate Park just last Saturday on Kennedy Drive at 30th when a tree off a of Monterey 
Cy Monterey pine tree fell and landed on her head and, uh, and she was found and, and the paramedics could not resuscitate her. It's a very difficult thing. And I think that there'll be continuous uh, talking about what to do to make things safer. And I personally think that you can't make things completely safe. And it's just, just a hazard to having beautiful trees. They're huge and they put lots of weight up in the air and everything that goes up will come down sooner or later. Just like every one of us who's alive will one day be dead. And it, it seems to me that that we just have to accept the danger that that having beautiful trees around, it's just part of it. And our, of course, our tree crew will be working double hard uh, when they go back to work next week. Uh, another flooded place, uh, Lloyd Lake, that will be just naturally draining over the next couple of weeks. And this is right next to the Buffalo Paddock. And these are two school teachers that taught at my son's elementary school in the neighborhood and they've been retired 20 years and they, they keep walking in the park and I love to see them all the time, but they were such good teachers that I, I sometimes, I keep kidding them that they should have, an, they've had enough retirement and they should go back and do some more good work in the schools. So this is one going up to the top of, of, uh, of Stowe Lake where every morning at 10 o'clock, there's a group of people that do Tai Chi on top of the hill. And even on a day like this, they got to the top. There's other ways to get there. And they had, they had Tai Chi almost every day during the storm. And they continue to have, uh, have their Tai Chi class. There's a woman in her 90s who goes up there every day with her walking sticks and, and does Tai Chi. There were several people that when they saw a tree like this or when they realized that there's the potential for trees to fall down like that, to say that we should close the island. And there are a lot of trees there. But today, when I was for a walk in the park, I saw so many people walking, marveling at the at what had happened with nature, that uh, I think that we should keep public spaces open to the public in almost every case. The other one, the Redwood Grove, we had almost no damage there. And the permits and reservations, they want to have a film shoot in there next week. And they called me and they were they were very surprised when I told them that that there was no problem and they should come in and and that there was nothing in the way, nothing preventing having a film shoot. Just be careful and look up. <laughs> yeah, the park I think is most beautiful at, as the light is coming and going. This is early morning and uh, the first mm, 20 blocks of the park are now closed to automobile traffic and just for people to to recreate it. And this is a rare moment when there's nobody in the picture and just the road and the whale. There's a little there's some artworks in the middle of the road. And there's maybe one more picture of the doggy diner head, but usually there's lots of people riding bicycles and running and jogging and walking. And uh, all in all, and the voters of the city and county of San Francisco uh, voted in favor of keeping this bit of roadway closed to cars. And uh, most people seem very happy with that. Oh. They, well, some people are happy with it and some people are not. And the people who are happy are very happy and the people who are not are very not. Right. It's uh, the interesting world. Anyway, it's uh, too many. Everybody wants to drive the boat. And... Uh, and when we and we we can't all drive the boat, so we have to figure out how to get along. And I can see how people don't like like not ha like having no cars, and I can see how people like to be able to drive just where they want to drive. So, Andy, how are um, is a park mitigating? I mean, thinning out the trees or um, selecting ones, or do they testing on the? I don't know. Can you test the root system to see if it's pretty solid or? The, the yeah. soil or how's the that park, all the, the park crew i think everybody in the park so the park is divided up into uh, seven sections i i'm responsible for section four from the de young museum down to 25th avenue and 30th on the lincoln way side and uh, that's section four and section three is the uh, is the botanical garden and section six is all the way down at the beach and section one 
takes care of the eastern end of the park, except for section seven, which was broken off of section one and takes care of the panhandle and some of the very eastern end of the park. And in years past, there were 12 sections in the park and we had sheep to help us mow the meadows. So the park, we could use more gardeners and we could certainly use more tree toppers. The tree crew is working through the park, trying to prioritize the things that most need cutting and doing them first. And obviously, if somebody gets killed, they should have taken that tree down the day before, but you can't always tell what's going to break and where it's going to break. I'm hoping that the tree crew, after this big storm, will maybe prioritize what seems most dangerous or most dead and letting that get cut down and fall to the ground. But they're working as fast as they can, but they still have, there's still more to do. Mm -hmm. So they have a um, whole tree crew taking care of maintaining the trees and um in in i'm not sure i think we have about 25 arborists working in the park mm -hmm. and we and they they the golden gate park from the park the tree crew takes care of all the trees in the city all of the recreation and park department trees which is over 200 parks and all of golden gate park and there's and they certainly do go around and try and do what's most wanted all the park foremen and all of the park managers try and give them as much instruction and request them to do this and do that. And uh, we could use a few more of them for sure. Andy, D Ted Kipping used to do it for the city when he was alive, but he, I thought he did it as a volunteer. That's not true. Or is it true? Oh, Ted Kipping did some work in the botanical garden. He didn't do work in the rest of Golden Gate Park, as far as I know. And that's a whole nother can of worms, having people do who can do what and who can do this. We have volunteers, but sometimes we can't take care of, you know, sometimes Ted Kipping certainly did a lot of good work. He actually worked for the park and then his brother also worked for the park for a time. And then in years afterwards, he would volunteer and do some very nice pruning. But I don't know if we can get other tree crews to come in and work gratis. But he did. He did. It did work out that he was able to do that. But to use for someone else to come in and do ser every now and then we do a contract, the capital division, we can sometimes get uh, outside tree trimmers to come and do specific things. But mm -hmm. it's actually hiring an outside contractor and administering those contracts actually costs a great deal more than just increasing our tree crew. And I hope that's what we do. But the way, the way funding works, it's interesting. When a bond passes and it goes to capital, capital has plenty of money, but, but capital funds can't be used for maintenance. And uh, sometimes we'll have to do a political fix to get some of that money moved out of that, that use and, and get it to, to take down other trees. We have a reforestation group in the, in the park that works clearing areas and starting new trees up. And, and they're making a lot, of, a lot of good progress. The park is interesting. We've seen you know, pictures of, of devastation, trees uprooted and this and that, but the park as a whole is beautiful and 99% of it is, is looking wonderful. And, uh, and on this rain is gonna make the park look better than ever for this next season. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Andy. We may have some more questions after the presentation. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Okay, and now, now we're going down to our southernmost location to Filoli at the uh, sort of at the south end of the San Francisco watershed lands uh, to hear from Jim Salyards, the director of horticulture at Filoli. Take it away, Jim, and hopefully your audio will work well. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Bart. Um, well, we, we took some things offline to hopefully boost our, our bandwidth uh, and I'll be okay. Um, I, I was just invited to do this presentation today and so I did not prepare any slides, um, but I will talk you through uh, what happened. We were, um, when this big storm started, on the 30th, 30th um, we were uh, at the tail end of our holiday event and we had had a couple days where we had had to close because of um, trees coming down when as the rains were starting. Um, 
And then on the 30th, we had a, a significant tree take down our, our power just as the, the, the rains were rolling in. And so um, that next morning on the 31st, I went down to see if the PG&E crew had, had wrapped up the work that they were um, doing to the power line. And um, that's when I started to see the significance of the storm. Um, there was uh, huge amounts of flooding in a couple low areas, um, mostly in the in the back area and, and in the, um, uh, the, the south part of the garden near the, the greenhouses and nursery. Um, I should I should say that for the most part the garden fared very well. Um, we have not as of yet had any major branches or trees come down within the garden so the garden is still looking good. But on that first morning about 645 as I was checking on the power um, I, I came out of the house and first heard a, a tree crashing yeah. down. Um, not and, very satisfying. And then done. went looking around for um, where that was, and, as, and on that search, I discovered that our swimming pool had filled, and the whole uh, swimming pool terrace um, was filled a, a few inches above the swimming pool, and so soil had had piled into the the swimming pool, and we're we're still um, trying to get that water clear uh, two weeks later, uh, and then from then. Uh, Joe and I spent the whole day um, going around the property trying to keep water moving. You know, after all these years of drought and having, or just, you know, nor normal to below normal to significantly be below normal rainfall years, um, we had not been paying attention to our drains on the property. Um, as, as many of you know, this has been a, at least at Philoli, a, a mass year for the, for the oaks, and we have millions of acorns that were also falling and clogging drains. Um, and so uh, so we did a lot of work just to, to keep the water moving. Um, finally, it, it slowed down that, that Saturday afternoon. Um, but toward the tail end of the day, we had a tree come across the road um, behind the garden, which um, had us trapped in the back area until we could have a tree com company come out the next morning. Uh, and take care of that. And we lost some trees around the orchard and on the, the um, entry road to the parking lot. Um, Sunday, we um, did a, a big survey of the property just to see what had happened. And, and probably very few of you, or if, if any of you have been to the old reservoir, the reservoir that uh, William Bourne built as his initial attempt to store water on the property um, for the garden. It's up at the um, back west end of the kind of the um, used portion of the property and uh, a significant landslide had happened upstream from that and had completely filled in our, our reservoir. Um, it's, it's just a novelty now, we don't use it at all, but um, it, was, it was devastating to see um, it completely filled with rock and mud um, that next morning. Uh, since then, we have had a number of more trees come down, um, all either on the on the perimeter of the garden. Um, with the wind events that happened the week later that week, um, we had some big trees. <coughs> um, we've had sections of fencing on the edge of the garden um, damaged, but beyond that, um, really the garden has has um, fared well. Uh, although I should say, um, with the flooding and the power outage that happened that first day, we discovered on the first that uh, our boiler that heats all of our greenhouses um, was completely underwater and uh, is a total loss. Um, and so we're in the midst of uh, getting a, a new boiler to replace that. Um, we've had power outage events, significant ones in the past, but not with seven inches of rain in 24 hours. <laughs> and so um, uh, so that, that, was, that was pretty devastating. Um, but trees continue to fall. We had one fall yesterday, um, and uh, we had our tree uh, out today. To so we we still have some cleanup to do. We still have some um, some more tree work to do. To to and uh, we're, we're watching and looking at our trees and um, and just uh, keeping our fingers crossed that nothing more happens. Thanks for sh sharing all that. You're welcome, Jim. Um, are you guys? having a uh were you guys able to clear all the drains that were all clogged up or how did that all work we have um but with some of these you know heavy rainfall events we've 
things have low areas have filled up again and again, um, water rushing over roads. Um, it's been, I think, three times there by the nursery where um, this whole field has filled up and you know, the, the drains weren't built for these huge rain events and, and everything is so saturated that the water keeps flowing. But, um, but yeah, all in all, um, uh, there was some damage on one of the road, one of the uh, old Kenyatta um, is the historic road that ran through this part of the peninsula. And um, there was a sinkhole um, on old Kenyatta. Um, and we, we, we haven't seen much of the PUC um, on the property attending to anything on our site. Um, we just imagine that they're dealing with their reservoirs and, and all the damage on the rest of their lands. Um, so hopefully that will be something that they'll attend to um, in the not too distant future. So I do have a question. You're dealing with the major garden and park and I'm dealing just with my own property and I have worked very assiduously because I was having some flooding issues and I've resolved all of them, which I'm proud to say. But are you guys now looking at this going, what can we do to make this better? Well, we're, we're definitely looking at it uh, in terms of all of our drainage. Um, yeah, and making sure that if uh, future storms and future years, um, things drain more properly off the property. You know, Sudden Oak is also a huge contributor to the flooding events um, because there are trees that have come down in woods and have blocked uh, drainage ways and, and we just haven't been mindful of them um, to the degree that we should be and and so that's something else that we're uh, we're going to be looking at um, just getting things cleared out so that um, water flows properly um, and quickly uh, off the off the land and into the creeks that run through the property um, so that's where we are at, at least at that point is just making sure the water moves the way it's supposed to because um, there have been other flooding events you know, beyond the garden that we've seen on, on some hikes that we've done. Um, so everything is just clogged back in the back areas because of, you know, a lot of it because of sudden oak and, and trees coming down. What about the reservoir that filled with debris? Are you going to abandon that or try to restore that? We haven't uh, really had a discussion about it. I mean, it, um, water is still flowing down the creek way that that fed that reservoir and so some of it's eroding out it may just take care of itself um but uh you know it was a, it was a huge uh, california newt habitat and so they no longer have that big body of water for um their reproduction and they actually are there year round um living in that reservoir so that might be the biggest thing that motivates to us to get that cleared out um at some point in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was very interesting. Yes, thank you. Walker's up. So yeah, Walker is joining us to speak about uh, what's been happening at the Ruth Bancroft Garden. And again, for those of you who don't know it, it's principally drought tolerant plants and succulent plants. So I'm sure there's some very different things that that they've been dealing with there. So take it away, Walker. Thank you, Bart. Uh, from seeing some of the photos that other people have shared, uh, I think we're, we're very fortunate that these Palo Verde failures in our parking lot and our entry plaza are just about the worst thing that we can report so far. Uh, in terms of the effect of the saturation that we've experienced since December 26, which has been pretty much constant. Uh, it's a little early to say how much, how, how, how severe the problems are gonna be, what exactly uh, price we're gonna have to pay for that. Um, but we certainly had a failure here with a desert tree experiencing entirely more moisture in the winter time than it would be accustomed to in the monsoons of the Sonoran Desert. Um, now, this uh, particular cultivar is Desert Museum, which is a Circidium and Parkinsonia hybrid. Um, and while the uh, breeders were successful in creating a spineless and very floriferous cultivar, um, it isn't really proving to be um, super uh, successful in, in, some, in some of our gardens when it's planted improperly or when drainage isn't ideal. Uh, these trees that are failing were all planted by a subcontractor or the builder who built our uh, visitor center, which we're very fortunate to have, 
um, and they planted the trees improperly. I'm not going to go into the uh, minutia of all the different ways that they planted the trees improperly, but suffice to say they were crowned. Um, they were irrigated by bubblers at the base as opposed to appropriate irrigation out of the drip line that would encourage uh, root incorporation. And the surrounding media to the plugs of Arizona caliche clay crowning the uh, root collars that they were planted in was a compacted gravel scheme, um, which was very well engineered, but didn't really encourage root incorporation. Uh, so uh, unsurprisingly, roots coiled around in the plugs of clay and there was plenty of water and nutrient available to produce copious vegetative growth above ground. And over time, leverage increased, wind blew, soil got wet, and over they came. Um, the image on the left you can see um, is uh, also something of an included bark failure where there was a seemingly okay, but apparently too acute uh, union there where some bark had become trapped uh, in between the two stems as they grew, and there wasn't entire fusion of those fibers and uh, forces were exerted. The water was sitting on that foliage. It got heavy, even blue, and explosion. So it's hard to, um, to deal with situations like this, right? We planted those trees almost five years ago, and uh, we had come to re rely on them for, for shade for our urban environment there. That's in the space between our building and the kiosk, um, which lets people into the garden and processes everything from our nursery and gift shop. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure if we're gonna replant these same cultivars. Now, all the ones that we planted ourselves out in the garden on mounds of free draining, structurally stable mineral soil have not blown up like this. Um, so it could well be that there's still a future for uh, Parkinsonia or Sarsidium Desert Museum, um, but it's sad. Overall in the garden, in terms of the succulent collection, we're seeing a lot of bloated, starting to explode and vitrify leaves, which are needing to be stripped off and cleaned uh, to prevent nefarious pathogens from getting in and running amok and rotting things out. Um, but you know, over time, as we've renovated the garden, these are sort of things that we have foreseen. You know, we experienced the El Nino of 17, the rainy winter of 19, the extreme single day precipitation event in October, 2021. Um, and in the aftermath of all of these things, uh, we looked at where we had extreme saturation, where we had extreme puddling, pooling. We installed sumps filled with coarse strain rock um, in as, as much as possible to give the water some place to go to create some puncture through the clay plan to, pan to allow something to go down into the aquifer. Um, and we, you know, we had some flooding, we had some pooling, um, but because of the sort of the preventative stuff that we've done in the past, it wasn't that bad. And, and the scale of our garden is very small compared to a lot of the other um, gardens that, that, the, that they're talking today. So on a few acres, this is manageable. I mean, I think this is definitely an opportunity for all of us to um, assess where we're vulnerable to extreme precipitation. And um, we should probably, you know, stepping back from our individual uh, experiences here with this particular storm, think about how this is going to potentially be the prevailing way that we experience moisture in the wintertime going forward as warmer temperatures and warmer oceans allow the air to hold more water. So when it does dump on us, it really comes down heavily. Um, and oftentimes at degrees greater than the soil can bear at a time, we start to have a lot of rot runoff, we start to have a lot of flooding, all the fun stuff that we're experiencing now. Um, so I would encourage all of you, you know, particularly those of you who are now going to be making decisions in book spaces or in heritage landscapes, in grand estates, in, in really big gardens, you got to replace some trees. Like take the time to do the structural amendment of the soil to truly open it up with something that's going to be permanently free draining uh, and give those things the best chance possible uh, to, to not get waterlogged and not be so susceptible to waterborne pathogens. You know, I'm uh, kind of closing my eyes and hoping that the many different pathogens that we have on site at the Ruth Bancroft Garden haven't just all crept all around through soil water infiltration into new places and gotten onto new novel root systems that they hadn't previously tested and uh, had gotten to nibble and munch on. Um, and so again, you know, we, I don't think we know exactly what all has happened yet, 
um, but this was pretty impressive. Uh, the Ruth Bancroft Garden since December 26, when, when this onslaught began, we've had over 15 inches of rain. So combined with that pretty good September sprinkle that we got and the other storms in between then and the beginning of this, these series of systems, uh, we are now over our <laughs> annual average, uh, which after all these years of drought is great, um, but I really wish that it would you know, spread itself out or would have spread itself out a little bit more. It looks as though after the uh, system on Wednesday, we're all going to get a little bit of a break and an opportunity for things to dry out and hopefully you know, assess what all has happened. So um, you know, my advice for people with succulents, gardens out there, go out and look and see what leaves have popped, ruptured, and become gelatinous, right? And get in there with your grubby little hands and extricate those leaves from the rosettes of your plants because those things are going to do you no good. Um, if you're stripping leaves on those, those types of plants, it usually works best to start at the bottom and work your way up and work with the sort of a lateral horizontal motion to try to get them off. Um, and if you can remove the ones which have already become, become to, you know, started to decay, then you can give your, your plants the best chance possible. So um, like I think everybody else here, we're just going to be putting out little fires um, and assessing for the next few weeks. And you know, maybe then we'll have a better idea about what, what really the, you know, we've experienced. Great. Thank you, Walker. Yeah, that's uh, good advice about the stripping off the leaves of the uh, very uh, overfilled with water ones to, so they don't burst. Um, getting back to your um, Palo Verde, is that kind of both wind and rain and water related? I mean, yes, and, and improper sale. planting here, right? Like I didn't want to like spend too, too long obsessing over the minutia of all that, mm -hmm. but um, understanding where a tree's root crown is, is really important. And with, with trees, understanding that, you know, roots can become bark, but tissues that start out as bark don't ever really want to become roots. And if you put those under the ground, then sadness ensues eventually. Um, so, you know, better to plant your trees high than low. Um, and uh, really important to use structurally appropriate soils in our climate where we're trying to grow all kinds of exciting things that don't necessarily occur in you know, habitats that, that experience winter rainfall at the degree that we do here in Northern California. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that, that um, well, I guess now it's Parkinsonia Desert Museum since there are no more Circidiums. Uh, so oh. it's no longer an intergeneric hybrid. But um, <laughs> it's, the, it's interesting that um, I've seen them planted all over uh, sort of what, from the Bay Area south to San Diego. And if they're quote unquote nearer the coast, they're just, um, they're not as good of trees as trees. They're more multi-trunk large shrubs. It's very interesting to go see them where they were originally selected. I mean, they're used as parking lot trees with trunks that are at least a foot thick and just straight up and then beautiful crowns. I mean, they just don't do that here. Uh, I'm thinking that perhaps around Bakersfield or maybe around Davis, uh, it, they might work out better. But even at Rancho Santa Ana, they really wanted to be gigantic shrubs uh, and branching way too low. And then the same thing would happen. There'd be a big windstorm and they would split out like that. I think that they're one hundred percent big, big shrubs, Bart, and you have to yeah. you have to work you have to work them real hard to make them look like trees. Those ones in the parking lot that were just starting to look like, you know, descending capillary desert leafy things for me. I had been in those things so many times, pruning them to to limb them up like that so that people could pass underneath, and so they sort of resembled multi branch trees rather than the giant shrubs that they wanted to be. Um, and as far you know, as far as Davis goes, um, some people in Davis probably know Gerhard Bach, um, and he I know he at some point or another documented a couple of Palo Verdes blowing over on him there too. Um, so they just are, are prone to doing it. And if you plant them high, if you, if you incorporate a ton of mineral stuff into the soil, porous volcanic rock in best case, 
that's going to give you the best chance for, you know, for success. Yeah, and where I was referring to them as parking lot trees is Boyce, Boyce Thompson Arboretum. In Anywhere in Arizona, right? You can yeah. see them all over the place in Arizona. And, and they're, they're just gorgeous. outrageously vigorous in, 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 in parking lots with way bigger spreads than they ever achieve before they time out here. Um, they're, they're amazing there. Yeah, again, they get all their rain in the me. summer. I think you guys need to come visit me. My Parkinsonias are behaving just like they do in Arizona. But I <laughs> this, I mean, one of them is probably already 40 feet tall and it's got a beautiful trunk. And the other one has suffered because the north wind one cold winter knocked it back hugely, but it's come back amazingly and now is becoming one of my primary shade trees. But I will say this, they are all on the upper side of a knoll. And are maybe yours the pure species, Kristen? Or are yours the, are the hybrid species. desert museum? I've got thorns and everything. Mine grew Okay, so, so what I've seen locally is that the pure species with the big pokey wokey thorns is very they're robust. Bad, I don't, I don't they're personally they're find it that bad, bad either, but the general public, they see the thorns and they're repelled, but they really like the spinelessness of a desert museum hybrid. And uh, I, I, my personal limited observation has been that the pure species Parkinsonia aculeata with the thorns does not have this problem, but right, it's these not really not, it's really, it's these really, it's these really nice hybrids, which have this tendency to well, explode or tip over. This obviously, because they didn't wait until the tree got to maturity to see how it would do, in my opinion. That's, I mean, you got to select when you do a hybrid, right? Indeed. Yeah, well, and again, it was selected and introduced in Arizona. It's only mm. fairly recently that Desert Museum has been brought into California. I think that probably the ones at Rancho that I brought in in the 90s were probably the first ones in the state um, that I'm aware of. And again, it's only become more common because they flower like crazy and they do have uh, hybrid vigor. But that again, they're not, it's, we're not Arizona, or at least not yet. Uh, and so <laughs> they're, they're just not as good as they are there. But Parkinsonia aculeata, as Walker was saying, as you're saying, is a wonderful, full-size, dependable tree in California. Remember, Circidiums, in, as a general rule, when they were recognized as an, their own group, were always like gigantic shrubs, not really trees. And this is a hybrid between that group and a Parkinsonia aculeata. So not terribly surprising that we're seeing this issue in a, for it, a cooler, uh, wrong season rains environment. Yeah, well, I have to say that I, I do have the Circidium that I understand from someone just a few days ago has now become Parkinsonia. And that one has never performed that well for me. They're, the two trees that I have are near each other. They were planted exactly the same time because I brought them both from Arizona. Mm -hmm. And the Circidium has been a total disappointment, except I keep it because of, um, you know, I'm a little bit nostalgic. But um, the Parkinsonia is a, a real workhorse. Indeed. Hey, Doak. Thank you, Walker. Thank, yes, thank, thank you very you much for Walker. having me. It was a it was a pleasure. Nice to okay. nice to hear from you all. So now we okay. have Andre Duran or Doran, D O R A N. Uh, Andrew Doran's our next speaker from UC Berkeley Botanic Garden or UC Berkeley Botanical Garden. Uh, or just yeah, they never have Berkeley in their name because they were first. So. Um, <laughs> That's why it's not the UC Berkeley Botanic Garden, Botanical ah. Garden. Thank you all for coming as well. Um, talk a little bit about um, our recent losses at the Botanic Garden. So uh, cover some plant losses, cover some the damage to the garden, and also cover um, preventative measures that we're doing to try and um, mitigate some of the storm uh, waters and also um, chat about a little bit about some of our insurance policies so not with an insurance company but uh, 
what we're doing to try and sort of make backup copies of the things that we're, we've lost. Um, the first um, uh, plant that we lost was um, Eucalyptus caibinensis. This is a, a 1976 accession um, and was a much loved sort of iconic and very architectural um, tree in our Australasian section. It went over and, uh, excuse me, it did actually have a cavity. Also, Andrew. Um, um, it's fairly rare, in, fairly rare in cultivation in California. So um, um, backup actually came in the form of Matt Ritter at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Actually, we gave him seed of this tree um, and hopefully we'll be getting some material back. However, it's just healed over. And um, I think if we you know, take it hard back as we have, um, we'll actually get quite a bit of stump sprouting. So the end is not completely nigh for, for this particular um, accession. What we also lost um, and will continue to lose um, is uh, Goan Cyprus, uh, Hesperocyparis goveniana. This is a 1986 accession that came down at the entrance to our redwood grove where we have a grove, a small grove of these trees. Um, you can see in the background to the right of that car, there's another one that is almost sort of like looking like it's on, on its way to a lean. Um, and it's actually going to be leaning right over the entranceway and right over the gates to the Redwood Grove. So we've got that one on watch as well. Um, this sort of took out a fence. Um, it was very kindly repaired by uh, John Kaplan, who was in the audience this evening. Um, but um, um, as I said, we're, we're, we're on our repairs um, right away. The second one was very close by. So um, I think this was a self-inflicted um, um, go on Cyprus suicide because um, suicide pact, as because they're all starting to go now. And we'd actually removed several of them in previous years. And come up, opening up um, uh, others to high winds has resulted in them actually healing over. So um, this one actually came down on the um, on the library, um, um, on the corner of the library. Fortunately, it hasn't really damaged the building, we don't think. But uh, again, it's um, um, another, another loss for us. This was a 1986 accession. Um, we had a very few losses in the Redwood Grove. Um, the, um, a dead um, Sequoia Sempervirens came down. Um, the, the main damage in the Redwood Grove um, is just this absolute litter of branches, um, large and small, that happens every time we get a, a high wind, um, making it uh, um, unsafe for people to, get to, to enter there. Um, and uh, the Golden Gate Parks mentioned that they're having a photo shoot. So are we. <laughs> and we've got a lot of cleanup to do before we can we can we can get uh, um, uh, get that together. So all of the paths look like the photograph on the right. It's just absolutely leaf litter, branch litter everywhere. Another um, uh, loss that was a little bit predictable because it had been copied coppiced down. Um, in previous years was this tree poppy, Bocconia um, frutescens. Um, and uh, that, again, wasn't entirely a surprise um, that the, the plant will no doubt generate a stump sprouts, uh, if I think we can see it doing. Um, so it's not uh, a huge uh, surprise or a great loss. Um, another one uh, that came down just very recently, um, or peeled over and is supported by another tree, is this Agathis robusta, um, a sort of a cowrie, Queensland cowrie. It was quite a, a young plant, but it uh, actually um, the same has happened to a, 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 um, a duplicate nearby. Um, we've got things on our watch list. This Erythrina was taken down um, um, by frosts in the 1980s right to the base and therefore became this multi-stemmed large tree as it stands today and it, it occasionally throws a fairly large limb on on a fairly public path so what this one is definitely on the watch list we've got uh, that that large 
uh, limb on the left hand side is on our is on our watch list, and we're probably in our next round of um, uh, uh, tree work. That's going to be um, one that we're going to take out. So um, we're, we've got a, a, a number of uh, streams and tributaries um, going through the garden, and uh, one of our sort of lines of defences are these debris barriers or grizzlies that the staff call them, um, and they they're very effective at stopping um, uh, large branches and boulders going into culverts. Um, but uh, if they become too backed up, the uh, the water can just surge right over the top of them. Um, and cause quite um, a, a fair amount of damage as we've experienced in, in the past. This damage is, is shown by this photo in 2006, where the grizzlies blocked um, and Strawberry Creek poured out over the road and into the Japanese pool, um, pushing all of the plants and, 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 and filling it with sediment out of there. Um, and the newts um, were no doubt not, not entirely happy about, about this, this occurrence. So um, keeping our grizzlies very clean, always checking them, you know, in a in a in a in, a, in, in adverse weather, um, is something we 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 do regularly um, to to make sure this does, we don't get a repetition. Um, we've actually noticed um, quite a few uh, tributaries and ephemeral uh, tributaries that are, are are active again that haven't been active in in many years. And in particular, the one um, on our left is, is dry, has been dry for 10 years and now it's, it's flowing. Um, the, the, the usually tranquil weed and deck um, waterfall has become a torrent. And I think I can give you an idea of the sort of volume of water that's passing through Strawberry Creek and heading down to campus. This is normally a very tranquil spot in the garden. You can see there we've got it roped off to stop people going down there. Um, other problems we face in the garden is our past uh, rutting and having um, sort of channels running, you know, running out all of the path finds and decomposed granite. The stairs, um, our, our stairs, uh, the, the, in, in, the tread infill washes out a lot of labor. And it's really good money after that. I mean, it literally washes down the stream um, and it's an awful lot of work to, to, to repair them, especially when you've got a photo shoot coming uh, on this very <laughs> path in the, in the coming days. Um, this is typical damage in the redwood growth. Um, again, very expensive um, to, to fix. So our insurance policies against uh, when, you know, when we have uh, plant losses are extensive documentation in the database. So we, we rely quite heavily on high resolution images of, of, of our accessions. Um, and these um, images can be loaded into the database and uh, um, uh, multiple image per accession. So should we lose it, um, we, we do have some pretty good documentation. Another form of documentation that we do is herbarium specimens. A lot of our collection has been vouchered. We have um, um, uh, um, uh, herbarium specimens dating back to sort of the um, turn of the last century. Um, and um, uh, this, this is a pretty typical one from the 70s. Um, these in turn can be imaged and, and added to our, our database and to our partner museums, the University and Jepson Herbaria down, down the hill. Um, you can see we can track label data um, of, of a garden accession. Um, and also we, we have uh, duplicate specimens. Um, uh, we can, um, we have, uh, um, we, in this case, we don't have a duplicate specimen, but in the case of the um, um, Hespero cyparis goveniana, we, we, we have uh, duplicates in the California section as well. Um, we also do a lot of seed banking, um, and um, uh, so that's another form of making sure that we, we don't lose um, specimens. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. On that, um, on your stairs, um, I mean, we have 
a lot of the similar issue. But what we also seem to have is that those wood stairs get very slippery. Yes. And that we have in the past used uh, stucco metal, you know, the stucco yes. Yes. stuff um, that you can then just attach to the wood and then it's no longer slippery. We have a few, a few of those. And then um, more recently, um, the, um, a, a volunteer project to, to replace some stairs in the Mexico and Central America section actually used those sort of metal stair noses that you actually see you know, they're, they're, they're uh, galvanized um, aluminum, I think, that, that uh, they're a little too, <laughs> looks like you're, you're an office. Um, but uh, anyway, it's, uh, um, we're, we're still experimenting with grip uh, on our stairs as well. So good to hear that you're not the only one that has the problem. Yeah, and that uh, metal does need to be replaced every so often. Yeah. I think a lot of ours were done probably 15, 20 years ago and need to be redone again now. Yes. I think we could have a full-time stair person. <laughs> um. <laughs> if I may intrude, if you guys can hear me. Um, the, uh, I'm a MacGyver solution uh, when you have erosion in a, in a situation like that that we've seen work uh, privately um, with areas where the gravel pathways had been attempted to be stabilized in the past, and that was inefficient. And uh, for one reason or another, the use of uh, some sort of geo grid in mm -hmm. the gravel areas um, mm -hmm. wasn't practical. That usually is the easiest way. If you can just scoop the gravel out, toss in a geo grid, put the gravel back, at least where you need it to be at a certain grade, the geo grid will stabilize it. Um, We've also found that uh, plaster Paris can be added. Um, you can churn it up, uh, compact to the grade that you want, however, manually with a uh, tamper or with a vibratory plate, um, and it'll lock down quite solidly. Uh, and you, you'll still have some degree of permeability because it won't really have created some out. Um, so that's something you could try. And you know, a, bead, a, a bead of coarse riprap or real coarse gravel alongside your stairways um, you know, could potentially create something that will uh, resist the erosion of the, the finer stuff that wants to wash away when you, everything's getting super saturated and it's just nuking down moisture and wind. Yeah, so I've been watching a, dry, a very steep driveway with one of those geo grids and it's holding, holding up pretty well. It works pretty great, you know, and when, when, when people are, are struggling with gravel, it's often the easiest way to make it not wash away anymore. Hmm. Good to know. What's essentially a geo grid for us lay people? <laughs> so there are super, uh, there are a great number of these products available. Um, the only three that I personally have um, experience with are one that's called Bod Pave, another one manufactured by DuPont, and another one called Diamond Grid. Um, and essentially, what these are are they are plastic or polymer grids. Um, which have uh, which come in rectilinear sections, um, usually two to four inches in depth, um, and have some sort of uh, diamond-like or hexagonal sort of pattern with gaps in between. Um, they clip together on the edges, and they can be used in a situation um, where you have an engineered permeable surface uh, that you want to resist erosion because you have a little bit of slope on it to some degree or another. Um, and so we're say you were going to have a permeable parking lot and you would excavate and then put in coarser stone and compact and then regular inch and a half or, or so drain rock and then compact. And then you'd be ready for your, your surface layer. Um, you'd put down a geotextile fabric and then potentially a little bead of, of some kind of gravel or sand to make a really smooth surface. You'd lay down this grid, lock all the sections together, and then fill it with a gravel. And you, and, and maybe you would even have um, a little bit of a fine dusting of, of, a, of a gravel on, on the surface. So you wouldn't even be able to see the grid. In an ideal situation, you wouldn't really want to expose the polymer or the plastic to ultraviolet radiation um, all that much because we know how all that stuff likes to eat plastic uh, no matter what we do to it. Um, and it really helps to keep the, pla the, the gravel in place and you spend less time raking and moving. And, um, you know, as those of us who have played with 
stabilizers of one kind or another, no. Um, certainly those liquid spray-on stabilizer products are not worth your time at all. Um, and in applications where you can have the supplier of the, the gravel aggregate thoroughly amalgamate the uh, powdered stabilizing material with the gravel, deliver it all mixed up, you can spread it out and you have full confidence that your installers are going to get it appropriately wet and then appropriately compact it. In the situations like that, where the grade isn't too steep and there's not gonna to be too much erosion exposure, you don't necessarily need a product like this. Um, but um, it, the GeoGrid is really an awesome thing. And for people who are looking to get rid of some nasty old asphalt or concrete and uh, do a permeable solution that isn't like a super, super expensive custom paver kind of job or something like that, uh, GeoGrid is an attractive alternative to know about as well. Great, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. explanation that was helpful any other questions for uh, andrew yeah i i have one about your agathas um <coughs> do you think that they were kept in containers too long and um and then planted out and because i know of those enormous ones that are totally out in the open at the huntington that are you know what a hundred and something feet tall and, and don't seem to have any trouble at all. That's really interesting. They're, they're very hemmed in by other, other, uh, other trees. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, again, there might be some losses nearby that could have opened them up. They, they also had a, a curious kink. Both of them had curious kinks in the, in the base of the stem mm -hmm. um, that... Uh, meant that they were probably leaning for, as juveniles for so I, i'm not i'm not sure if Bart, that's a good question i'll I, what i'm going to do is ask around about the history of those and, and see if i can get back to you yeah well and that uh, it is one of the few conifers that you mm -hmm. can grow from leaf cuttings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we, we you can grow those. lots and lots of them now right <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, and I think um, I'm the next one. And well, this gives you an idea of how Wildcat Creek looks uh, uh, during our big rain events. Uh, the photo on the left was taken by uh, one of our gardeners, Ben Anderson, on December 31st uh, after the worst of the intense rains. And that just shows you how high the water gets uh, compared to just a few days ago on January 10th, when we still have lots of water coming through. But you can see on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left, uh, just the volume of water and the depth of it, particularly up against that wall on the right-hand side. Uh, it's getting very, very high. Uh, as far as I know, we didn't have any uh, breach of any of the edges of the creek. We have in the past, but apparently even though there was this much water and it was that much out of control, it didn't breach any of the edges this time around. Or if it did, it was very, very minor and we haven't even noticed yet. But that just, shows you also why the garden was closed for about a week. <clears throat> when the water is that high, uh, and we do have, as many of you know, many bridges over the creeks, some of which are uh, better than others, uh, some of which we don't know much about uh, engineering-wise, uh, that uh, it is sometimes just better to close. And the entire park district was closed, as I think most of you know. Um, and we reopened late last week on Thursday after being closed, I think a total of seven or eight days. Uh, this redwood tree on the right uh, had a double leader up there at the top which you can see sort of where it was. And this is right at our back service gate, the first big redwood. 
again, it probably should have been removed decades ago when it was small. And that interestingly enough, I mean, that lawn area is to the west of the garden. And that is where the top came down. That's actually the big picture shows you how it landed on the ground across the road. So uh, the winds were obviously mixing around and not, not just coming from west to east, uh, which is the prevailing way. Uh, and this, that's probably why this tree broke out at that point. Um, but to be thrown that far, uh, you have to understand how, how what huge the, the storm was up here. Again, we're just over the ridge uh, from Berkeley and just before the final ridge before you get into um, uh, Orinda area. So we can get incredibly high winds up here from time to time. Surprisingly, within our rainforest section, we lost a couple of trees, actually a total of three. And they were all the same accession, just different uh, age and condition. Well, they're all the same age, different size and condition. Uh, they were all Suga, Suga heterophyllos that had been planted for decades. Uh, they're fairly slow growing in our location. And that they fell completely over. This one was almost like a pencil. So staff was easy, uh, was able to quickly and easily remove it. Uh, however, we had larger ones go over. And the one on the left that you're seeing just happened to fall in between all of those trunks of one single Ulnus rhombifolia. Uh, which is by this large bridge that's just at the beginning of the canyon section of the garden. Uh, so surprisingly, those alders are fine and the bridge is fine. Uh, the tree obviously is not. Uh, and then another, the third one uh, went down actually earlier and also had this much or more soil come up as well. Um, so those were the major trees that we actually had problems with. Just to give you an idea of how much water there is, this is one of our lawns on the right. And you can see it's not raining right then, but the water is still just sheeting across that lawn. That's in our Santa Lucia section. And then up, up by our visitor center, where we um, stage a lot of fallen material and so on, uh, there's a small drain right up here that clogged at one point just recently, and that uh, this section of path uh, washed out, and you can even see a drain line and up here an irrigation line that got exposed from the amount of material that washed away. For those of you who visit the garden regularly know that we do uh, protect a lot of our plants in advance. Um, usually starting in late November or earliest December uh, for cold and hail. Uh, so a lot of the plants that were protected, I mean, like here you can see this just uh, acrylic um, over this Dudleya bretonii to keep it from getting uh, ruined by hail uh, is actually just fine. We did have considerable amount of hail um, here at the garden. And there you can see it. Uh, this was on January 10th. And some of those uh, hail stones were up to a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, it was very sudden and very intense. And there's not a lot you can do when that happens if you haven't already prepared. And that this just shows a couple of things that weren't ready. We thought that these Dudleyas that were completely under um, island oak in our nursery would be fine. But as you can see, much like Walker was talking about, some of these leaves just got pounded by that ice and are now just mush. And we'll have to remove all these leaves. And then all these white speckles 
are on a part of our agave shawi eyes that weren't uh, well enough covered for this event either. Uh, the agaves will be fine. I mean, if they get too much rot in them like this, that gets much larger, we'll have to remove some of these leaves. But these Dudleyas, and these are all povirulentas uh, that were grown from seed, uh, are going to have to be um, completely denuded of large leaves uh, so that they won't just rot away completely. And then I did put in this little video, which I'm, yeah. You can see the size of some of those hailstones and just how intense it was. I'll play it again. Uh, so you can just look at the what the sky was looking like or the view across the garden. There was so much of the um, hail that it was all, almost as if it was fog. And I think that's that's all that I have and all that I wanted to show. I mean, that um, we were, or we consider ourselves pretty lucky out of all of these storms. We didn't get that much damage, um, but there's still a tremendous amount of water flowing through here. And much as was mentioned by others that, uh, particularly Walker, uh, we have a lot of different phytophthoras here at the garden. They're waterborne. When you get as much water in a short amount of time as we have, and you see it just sheet flowing across the garden, yes, it is probably sp spreading those pathogens to new and new areas that were not previously uh, infested. So um, it will remain to be seen what happens. We also had one of our uh, Arctostaphylus glutinosa, which is the, the endemic species from the chalks in uh, the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, one of them just kind of moved forward. It, um, if you look at it, you don't think it really moved at all, but I know that it moved about, what, eight feet. Uh, because I, it was one I was going to take cuttings of, but I couldn't reach, and it, I would need to walk back into the bed to get to it, and now it's all the way to the edge of the bed. So, um, however, I think it will be fine. It didn't uh, seem to uproot, uh, but that was just a little bit unexpected, and part of that probably was because we had coppiced some of the tomentosas in front of it uh, that were getting too large um, and that the glutinosa was a more important collection. Um, but that's sort of all I have. Are there any questions? Do you have any sense when the garden will open? Oh, the garden reopened last Thursday, even though uh, we left on our uh, on the friends webpage that the garden was closed until Monday simply because we had we had canceled all garden events um, and we didn't want people thinking oh the garden's open oh those events are going to happen when we had already canceled the events when the park district closed the garden uh, and the whole park district it it no one knew when we were going to reopen and we were taking everything day by day. And so it, um, uh, it took a while before um, we knew when we were gonna reopen. And again, we, we found out the middle of a morning, Thursday morning that Tilden had reopened. And if Tilden had reopened, then we should reopen. Uh, but they forgot to tell us that they were reopening. <laughs> So are there questions? I see. Um, Bart, Bart, this is Beryl. I have yeah. a question about those Dudley is the um, hail damaged uh, leaves. If you just left them on the plant, would that cause the plant itself to die? 
Possibly, it depends sort of on what sort of rot gets into those leaves. And like Walker said, if it gets into the stem, you really want to prevent that. Um, and, and again, those leaves are never going to recover. Uh, Dudleya leaves are so soft. So yeah, I was um, just wondering about the labor. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll do that. Um, a lot of our Dudleyas, a lot of our larger Dudleyas in the garden are covered. So I think they were fine. Um, it was just that one flat that we were actually planning on getting planted out and hadn't gotten it planted out yet. And we, I thought it was near enough the tree trunk uh, and under heavy enough canopy that it wouldn't get uh, that damaged, but it certainly did. I've got a, a question in general for all of you uh, folks who deal with the trees. Most of what we seem to see that were falling were evergreens. Um, and I assume that's an issue because of the wind at this time of year. But for homeowners, I'm just curious. I, I have a lot of mature native oaks um, and I've spent a lot of my garden budget in, with arborists and tree trimmers to make sure they're thinned out. Um, and I'm wondering, honestly, if that's enough. I haven't had any failure here. And um, of course the deciduous ones, I wouldn't expect to be a problem, but I have a lot of native corkers agrifolias that um, I would hate to lose. And I don't know if, if just thinning them, uh, lightening the load, as they say, is, is adequate or whether you guys, you know, whether it's Jim or Andy, or you folks with these larger trees, were the ones that failed uh, maintained as far as pruning? I mean, were, were they really heavy or uh, could you see any pattern? I think that I can answer part of that as far as the conifers in particular, mm -hmm. um, the redwoods, the, the Hesperosuppresses mm -hmm. and the like. It's that um, our cypresses tend to uh, when they're big, they will collect a lot of water weight up there unless it gets windy and shakes them out. But that there's usually so much weight there that that's what causes them to split and, and fail. And that we've lost many branches on our big Forbes EI, but so far none out of these, this series of Forbes. And we have a Goviniana that I keep expecting to split in half because it's like this, uh, almost from the ground. And again, our, our native cypresses in general are not long lived plants. I mean, Monterey cypress right on the coast is, but um, almost all the rest of them, you could say 30 years is a good lifespan for a native cypress. And if you bring Monterey Cypress inland, you won't get th even 30 years out of it. And for the oaks, yeah, uh, at Rancho, because of the patterns of rain and the infrequent and yet huge amounts, I mean, I think at Rancho, we had a year where we had like five inches of rain. And then the next year we had over 60. And so, yes, we would spend money to, or I would see to it that we spent money on our major important oaks to the collection to have them thinned out a bit uh, so that they wouldn't get too heavy or be too much of a wind flag. Oftentimes what happened at Rancho was when uh, we would get rains uh, late in spring or early in fall and followed by or concurrent with extreme winds. And then what we would do is we would lose the younger, denser trees that acted as wind flags and held so much weight in them that they would just blow over partially, even though they had great root structure. Thanks. Other people have comments there? I can chime in. Um, this is Jim. We um, we did not have any trees that we regularly maintain um, fail for us. It was uh, ones that are um, you know along the edge of places that are <clears throat> we're not in um, 
in more the ones that were in more natural areas that, that failed um, for us, except for the one that fell yesterday, um, which had a, uh, a root issue, uh, but the tree itself, um, well, you, you just don't know when the root issues are happening sometimes and, and until they come down. Um, but yeah, all, all the trees within the garden um, fared extremely well. Walker, I have a you have um, something to say. I have a, a, a comment for the broader uh, public who are watching who are having anxiety about you know their mature trees in these conditions, and that is when you're um, you know, you're getting a contractor to come in, an arborist or a, a tree trimmer, hopefully an ISA certified arborist. Treesaregood.org is a wonderful way to find an actual ISA certified arborist to come work in your trees. Um, on mature trees, they should be doing the work out of the tips of the branches. They shouldn't be sawn off big giant chunks. You know, that is not the solution to your problems. They should be <laughs> light lightening the load out on the outside where the maximum amount of leverage is being exerted. Um, and then stepping way back in time, decades in time from that place that you might find yourself with your mature trees. You know, it's a good reminder to assess the juvenile trees in your landscape and make some structural pruning decisions now to set your trees up for success, to have structural soundness so that the branch connections that they do make are ones that are going to support that load when they become big, monstrous, giant biomechanical structures in time. Um, and so, you know, all of this, it's, it's a good opportunity to reflect on, 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 you know, our own failings, the failings of those who came before us in the landscapes and, you know, ways that we can do better going forward and set the whole thing up to kind of endure these sorts of extreme events that we're going to see more and more. Well, I, I do think it's important that those of who, who inherit gardens um, and property need to understand how to take care of the trees because that's where I am. I have a lot of, uh, I, I, I love where these, where I am and have a lot of trees, but they had not been taken care of before I came here. And so I do know, and I got arborists and, you know, I got right, the right people, but they did take out some major limbs in some of them to, to lighten them because it really were um, top heavy. And so I, you, as you say, you've got to trust the arborist and make sure you don't just have, uh, you know, you say a, a tree trimmer, you, you have someone who knows what they're doing. But for the, those of us who do inherit gardens, uh, most of us here are already, you know, we have been in our gardens a long time, so it's maybe not such an issue. But as we talk to others who who move into places, it's really important to to recognize what's going to happen with weather and trees and, and how they might be able to take care of them. And I, um, particularly the evergreen trees, which seem to be so susceptible to wind damage this time of year. Indeed, and as you say, you know, sometimes you get yourself in a position where you have to make decisions and no matter, you know, whether it's the most esteemed expert or, or not, um, sometimes some big pieces have to come off, but, you know, to the best of our abilities, we can all work to try to prevent those scenarios of putting that kind of stress on our trees and, and then getting in positions where we're, we're anxious, you know, are they, are they healing properly? Um, have I, have I been doing that introduced significant structural uh, weakness into the, into the whole structure? You know, um, it, it's all, it's all really difficult, but truly our trees are, are, are a wonderful resource. And, you know, we at the, at the Ruth Bancroft garden have been super lucky to keep our, keep our big ones through all of this. And I hope that, you know, as many of them can stay standing as do. Yeah. And I would say that um, it's, especially important on conifers to deal with double leaders as soon as they are noted. Whether it's at the top of the tree and the tree is old or whether it's a young tree, deal with it now, not later. I mean, I know that it is one of the things that when I first came to this garden, I noticed that an awful lot of the conifers do have double leaders here and that we dealt with probably about 50 of them. Uh, but then there were some like that redwood that were just way too high, way too big and that had been left too long that it would, um, that we're really just weren't sure what to do there. So actually it is being climbed tomorrow uh, to be assessed as to whether that remaining piece stays there and the wound gets cleaned up or not. Um, 
or whether it gets cut off now, and then we're going to have to do um, some other interventions over the coming several years as, as competing leaders emerge at the top of the tree to thin it back to one that will work out. We've had to do that already on a number of the sequoia dendrons in our sequoia dendron grove uh, due to the drought and phytophthora uh, they weren't able to get enough water up to the tops of the trees because they're getting too big. Uh, and as many of you know, it's a fairly crowded grove because James Roof liked groves of trees, not individual trees. And so, uh, so we were losing the tops of several of them and we had them climbed and, and cut off and cleaned up to the extent possible. And then we've had them revisited several times now uh, to, to keep them in as good a shape up top as possible. It's not cheap, but it's better than having the whole tree fail. Art, do you hire um, private arborists to do that kind of work? Yes, we do. Actually, staff are not allowed to uh, do significant tree work other than, like I was mentioning, those removals. But um, I think that they don't like it if we're uh, like 15 feet off the ground. Um, I think it's 10 to 15 feet in general that um, uh, they don't like, even though we do have certified arborists on staff. Bart, can I make one more comment? Sure. Um, for people who are looking to have trees assessed, what you want is somebody who has one of the consulting arborist certifications, not just an ISA certification, right? Because I have an ISA certification, but those consulting guys know wildly more than I will ever know about assessing the, the, the delicacies of these trees. And ultimately, oftentimes it turns down, it comes down to the, the sort of the feel of somebody who has a great deal of experience making a call on a tree. There's a thing that'll kill one tree, might not kill another, you know? Um, and they often respond, same species in slightly different conditions respond dramatically differently. And it's really hard to predict exactly when, you know, you're gonna have a failure or not. Um, but you want to, if you're gonna have somebody come look, get somebody who has that consulting arborist sort of, sort of pedigree, and they're gonna be able to give you a better assessment about what you're dealing with. And then you go from there. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that, Walker. That's very helpful information. As was all your other information that you gave us this evening. Oh, you're thank, th thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you guys, everybody, for um, all those questions and answers. We do have some participant um, weather challenges and mitigation ideas that we're going to go now to. First up is. Nancy Schramm, are you here? Yes, here yes. <laughs> Howdy. I shot a video of this that I thought the uh, single image would suffice. That's uh, a gopher hole. And the water is shooting four inches up out of the ground. And that went on for hours and hours. Hmm. Uh, there's a steep hill behind us. And um, there's an extensive... Uh, system of gopher tunnels. And did that cause any problems besides flooding right there? Um, not so far for me um, by the house here. Um, there's other spots on the hillside where um, just as much water is coming out, but mm. with the water being able to exit above ground, that makes all the difference. So these happened in 2017. Um, the um, culvert that went under our road suddenly started, um, the water started going just directly uh, underground instead of flowing above ground to the pond. And a series of sinkhole type situations happened. Um, those are about three feet wide and three feet deep and 
uh, there was a whole series, probably about five in total of these um, tunnels or exposed tunnels. And that's what happens when the water goes underground and then just continues underground and you know it can't it can't go can't go up so what i do when i am trapping gophers is i will go along and collapse the tunnels um, as far as i can um, just so that there's fewer tunnels for the water to go through i don't know if that's the best solution or not I know the watershed keepers at Crystal Springs, a big part of their job is to keep the gophers trapped on all the earthen dams so they don't have their dams collapse. Good point. I've been yeah. seeing the, um, the, the pressurized gopher burrows uh, in Alexander Valley, um, where I live uh, a lot. It's pretty amazing how, you know, water sticks to itself and it rides gravity and it finds a burrow in the ground and the ground is super saturated and it just flows through that burrow and eventually it finds the lowest hole where a gopher once came out to the surface lower down a slope and it starts gushing out it's pretty incredible on erosion that happens and it's a really great example of how erosion happens when we see these big gullies the water will sheet across an area until it just starts to eat at one spot and as soon as that erosion begins in that one spot it's all over um, and just as easily it's kind of infuriating and amazing how little correction to the slope or how little of a swale it can take to direct the water away and prevent the erosion from you know worsening in in, in some scenarios but yeah the gophers are, are brutal um the if you're Locally, we have a company called Trapline Products. They're somewhere here in California, I think in the South Bay. Um, and they make a stainless steel sort of Maccabee type snappy gopher trap. And if you can find the main tunnel and you can put one in each way and find the main tunnel somewhere new every 24 to 48 hours and keep setting a couple to usually get them. And it's usually uh, kind of amazing how much damage is wrought by just one of those cute little gophers. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time with finding an active runway or whatever. Um, and you're talking about the main burrow. In the, in, the, in the spring and fall, if you use some sort of soil probe, um, you can, and the soil is a little bit softer. Like our soil gets so hard when it's dry, our clay soils, which is the majority of us have, gets so hard uh, in the dry season that it can be really difficult to even push a probe into the depth that you might find the main tunnel. Um, but in, when the soil is a little bit softened, if you find the freshest mounds where the gopher's been excavating, and then you probe around in the general vicinity of those, eventually you'll find it and you'll kind of be able to identify it. And you excavate there, you stuff the little traps in, you mark them so that you know where they are, cover it back up again and keep going. And you eventually catch Mr. Gopher. Yeah, I'm pretty successful if I can find the dang uh, tunnel, but <laughs> that's my problem. Okay. Thank you, Walker. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Anything else you want to add to that, Nancy? Um, I I do a lot of trapping, um, and I'm pretty successful with the Maccabees. And it's true, I have kind of the trapping season is when the soil is moist enough that I can actually enlarge the tunnels just enough so the trap will actually fit in uh, both uh, set and sprung and there was uh, one year I kept track of how many gophers I got on my less than two acres and one one year when trapping season I got 30 gophers wow <laughs> that's a lot of gophers but that's a pretty good size piece of land though too yeah well there's just that <laughs> much land above us too so I can't exactly trap on the neighbor's property <laughs> yeah that's true okay thank you nancy yeah barrels experiment yeah um i guess it's all i don't really need to add anything to that do i <laughs> well you said you're keeping track of what's staying alive and you said that uh, well, it wasn't rooted correct Oh no, the aloe um, was in soil. A soil. Oh. The aloe is is uh, is in a uh, container with soil, 
-hmm. And I put it in that bucket just to um, more get to get the soil wet, and I never took it out of the bucket, so it's still in the bucket. But um, you know, <clears throat> I've had experience. Um, like I had an Echeveria um, Twilight. What is that one called? It's it's not called Twilight, but it's um, it's it's its name is like during that time of day twilight, and I had it um, in a five gallon bucket of water for a very long time, and I was shocked when I when I saw it, and it 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 was fine <laughs> when I took it out. There was no absolutely no damage to it, um, even though. You know, it was drowning in a bucket of water for months. Mm. So, um, so are you planning so on I'm, emptying these? Say that again. Are you planning on emptying these? No, I I want if if they show some damage, I will. I'm going to keep watching them. If if they, I mean, right now, you know, they're not showing any damage at all. So that's part of my experiment. Okay, Just report to... back. Okay. Is that a couple of weeks or a couple of months? Um, a couple, well, it's since the heavy rains, um, the aloe's been in a, in a lot of water probably for a couple of months already. Not that much water, but it's been sitting in that five gallon bucket um, I just, I just for a couple of months, that, that cotyledon is not going to rot off, and I think all of them are going to die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, report back. We'll do. Okay, so this is my vegetable garden. I have it in a, uh, a uh, water trough, and I dug all the. Nothing was growing in there, so I dug it all out, and a root from I think the tree that's near there went up through the drainage holes and it was just filled with roots. So I dug out all those roots and there, I filled it with some water and it did drain, but there's not that many holes in it. But um, so then I filled it back up with water or with soil and replanted my vegetables and thought there'd be enough drainage in there. And obviously there is not. And I was gonna drill a couple of holes on the side on the bottom there uh, by my new roommate there. And, um, I haven't done that yet, but then I, on the back side there's a plug, and do I just get a big old wrench to undo that? Doesn't seem like there's a whole lot to hold on to there. Does anybody familiar with the drainage holes on these things? Not on that specifically, but I have something that looks almost like that, and that that I have undone, and I just got a um, something that fit in there, and then used a wrench. Now, what do you mean fit in there? Fit into the square hole. There are in the oh, square hole square there, hole. Ellen. Ah. Depending how big that is, what if that is either if that's depending on the, the scale of what we're looking at. If that's a, a common ratchet size, quarter inch, three eighth, or half inch, mm -hmm. you can usually stick a, you know a, a, a ratchet straight in there. Um, oh, just the, the part if that not, you put the thing on. Just in that white plug that protrudes, and then you're going to find yourself with, with a larger hole from there. And if, you, if that isn't big enough, what you're probably going to have to do is dig down on the inside of the container, and then that black ring that you see on the outside, uh -huh. you're going to be able, you're going to want to you know turn that one counterclockwise. On um, and you may be able to spin it right off. You may also have to grab its its uh, sibling on the uh, inside of the tank as well. Mm, okay. Um. So that I'd have to do it from the inside if I do the black one and I do it from the outside. The you, white. you might, you could try putting a large wrench around the out, the, the black one, but uh, I would start with the white, the white plug um, that you can see there. And then if you got to take the whole thing off and just expose it right back to the hole that they bored and the galvanized before they put that fitting on there, mm -hmm. you know, then, then you go there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it depends if that, if that white thing has been glued in or if it's screwed in. 
I don't think I did anything to it. It's manufacturer, <laughs> however the manufacturer does it. So it's probably meant to be taken opening up if you need to drain it, I would assume. But doesn't it look like there's, you're beginning to get some rust at the top of that? Here? Like maybe 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 the metal is beginning to fail there. I don't know. I think it's just corrosion and dirt. Um, I don't know it's in the back side here where all these bridges are, which makes it difficult to get back there. But um, the square part, I'm going to try that one. But I have a little lake right at the moment. So I just noticed that. Didn't realize that. Thank you guys for those that information. Okay, so uh, Jeff, are you still here? Yes. So uh, uh, Bart's picture uh, certainly trumps this, but <laughs> this is also from the same day, I think the 10th, uh, when we got the hailstorm throughout the Bay Area. And uh, I just thought it was a fun picture to show a, a succulent garden that is uh, covered in hail. Um, I don't think I'm going to lose anything from this garden. Um, most of the plants that I'm uh, probably going to lose, I'm losing more from uh, uh, being saturated with water uh, rather than the cold temperatures from the hail that was very uh, fleeting. Mm -hmm. Is that, a, um, oh, what do they call those things? Is your plant in the middle of the star shaped one uh, have the dots before? Or is that down there? Yes, uh, that okay. is the patterning that comes with the, uh, whatever the hybrid is, uh, okay. this, or, uh, yeah. And- uh, Castor aloe, it looks like. Yeah, that's a very handsome plant though. Uh, it's one of my favorite of, uh, of that type and uh, it's uh, been growing really well. I certainly hope uh, the cold weather or the water isn't going to uh, kill it. I did lose a cactus in this. It's, this is a very shaded, uh, cool area. Uh, so it's, uh, things grow very slowly and some things don't survive. Growing on the edge. Yeah, so just a fun picture. Yeah, here at the Botanic Garden, the hail didn't immediately melt. Um, I, I was here what, probably three or four hours after it hailed and there were still quite a few patches of it around when I left after dark. Uh, wow. Did yours um, melt right away, Jeff? It, uh, except where it kind of piled up, but in most areas it was gone within 45 minutes. Hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And Kristen, we have Kristen's water capture system. So uh, on my first two tanks, these are olive oil tanks. The ones that are wrapped in the brown sheets were inherited from a guy I used to drink coffee with. And the second two tanks, my son works at the wastewater management place and people dump their tanks. He's himself has uh, started um, a blog on recycled water, uh, actually was interviewed by the Huffington Post because he was talking about recycled water back about four or five years ago already. And um, Dick, when he was alive, my husband wanted, just filled up the tanks with a hose from our rain barrel that he rigged up in such a way, uh, you can see the rain barrel in the center. Uh, the water goes in and overflow goes out back down the tube, but uh, out the tube back into the drainage uh, um, pipe. But there's a, you see next to it is a garbage can and um, you can take uh, the tube that's on the right and put it over into the garbage can and put a pump in and then you can start pumping all the water out. And you'd be amazed, this is not a very big roof and a quarter of an inch will actually, an inch will fill up almost all the tanks. That's how fast it goes with the pump. So my son is really pushing me. He wanted me to put in a cistern instead of my pool, but I happen to like swimming. And so I told him that wasn't happening. There is also another kind of thing called a water wall. I'm just telling you this because people forget when Al Gore came out uh, first with an inconvenient truth, they did an analysis for California and they said we were going to have lots of drought. And then they said when it rained, it was going to pour. 
And uh, we just are coming off the drought. In fact, mentally, I still can't get over that we're not in a drought right now. I mean, they keep saying we're still in a drought until they say so, but we've had 27 inches of rain already. Uh, our average in a year is 26. Uh, we've had as little as 10. And I, I, um, I consider us out of the drought, considering what I'm reading as projected. But uh, when my husband died, he, he loved playing in the rain. I do not. My son came over and said, Mom, I can simplify your life. So I have two rain barrels running this. The picture on the right here is, a, is a, an attachment that I can put a hose into. And it runs to the tanks. And then he equalized it out so that um, I can do it with all just one barrel. I have two barrels that can feed this or two barrels with all kinds of valves. And he put in these plastic um, clear tubes that we could see how high the water is. And then all, if it should overflow, because we, you know, it seems to always rain at night when I would rather be sleeping, um, the water then could come out from the first picture on the right hand side and go into a hose, which I have the hose connected to a sprinkler system. You're, you're probably thinking I'm totally nuts. I had to disconnect everything, by the way. But uh, a sprinkler system, because my neighbors insist upon growing redwood trees and, and uh, sequoia trees, literally that are four feet apart. I tried to get them to cut them down, at least one of them. The roots are always coming into my yard. And last two years ago, I literally had my gardener go and dig a two foot hole, take out all the giant roots that had already raised up my sidewalk and my uh, hell strip. And, um, and my husband was freaked out thinking the trees were gonna fall. And I said, if that's the price I have to pay to get rid of these trees, I would have no problem. But doing that made that area possible for me to grow things, which I couldn't do because the redwoods always ruled. But I have a sprinkler out there for when it rains, again, during the drought, mind you, because water was scarce. And um, this system connected to that sprinkler system so that it forced water out into that area to give it more water. I... I often wonder the the last drought before this last the previous drought to this last one we had I think two or three years of no rain then we got 45 inches of rain that year and that then was the only year we got rain and then we got went back into a drought first year they don't say it's severe of course the second year they say it's severe and then it's ex extreme was this last year and this is a way to get water onto your property and I do it everywhere. I have birch trees. I was told they never survive in California, but those are the heritage tree of my husband and he loved birch trees. And so uh, my son insists that they have to be kept alive. And um, I guess what I'm saying is I personally believe not only do we have to manage the plants and the hills and the drainage, we have to manage our lives differently in California to be prepared for drought and to be prepared be prepared for these huge rains. I put an, a six inch pipe out to my street with four, four holes for those years. And uh, my neighbor didn't take care of his drainage and he finally did this year. And I have, since he finally did it, I have no pond in my driveway, but you have to be prepared. It's part of living here. You're going to have to expect that there's gonna be a lot of rain some years. And other years you're in drought and you have to be set up for all of that. And I guess I brought up this part of it because we just got out of this drought. Okay. You got another slide, right? Uh, do I? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. So this shows the, the pump on the left-hand side are actually all from Home Depot. I have learned how to operate all these pumps uh, I had a non-submersible one and my son went ballistic when he found it. I had submerged it. I had no idea when I started out what I was doing here, but um, this is all three are now submersibles. I use one in my pond and um, I mean, they're very good and useful tools when you have a lot of rain or a lot or less rain because you can, I now put my pond on a regular uh, switch that is normally how I, um, it has a little fountain in it to keep it aerated. 
and I can just turn it on when I think the pond is overfilling. And then the other two are used in the garbage cans to uh, move the water out to areas in the drought times, like the birch trees or other areas of the yard that don't get enough water in the drought times. But they're also useful in the rainy times, as I said, for the pond that might overflow. And on the right here, I took this picture because this shows uh, I follow the white pipe towards the right and I capped it now because I don't want to um, uh, send water out there anymore. There's too much water on the property now. Uh, but you can see the hose that uh, I connect to the uh, far right. It goes out into the garden and I can move the irrigation wherever I want to. Uh, the other thing I had to learn is about siphoning. You forget that you know you've just created this huge flow of water out of the pipes and uh you don't i don't want to empty my tanks yet because i'm paranoid i mean you should i i'm struggling with my drought mentality and saying you don't need to bring water out to the garden right now it's quite challenging for me but i'm getting used to having water and um but at any rate i i see a lot of us i mean these water walls we don't have enough availability in our area for these water walls. You can get them so they're all of eight or nine inches wide and uh, they can fit right under the eaves of your house and they can be 10 feet tall. It's an amazing amount of water you can put into them. What's a and water wall? Excuse me. Um, I'm not familiar with that term. Okay. So it's a rain capture watering system mm -hmm. and um, it is designed to hold a lot of water, but be rather inconspicuous. I believe there, well, a lot of them are used in Australia. Hmm. And we should be looking at having water walls uh, next to our houses and maybe along our fences. You don't have to have a cistern. It's a, an upright cistern. Okay. Imagine a, a tall but not particularly deep uh, yes. water tank that yes. could easily sit next to a house. Yeah, yes. well, and that remember, or I remember from the 70s, uh, Village Homes, the first solar subdivision uh, in, in Davis, California, where they were using those as thermal mass, uh, just indoors on the sunny side of the house uh, for heating and cooling the house. Uh, Interesting. And that... Yes, it was all water and it was all sort of a translucent, huge thing. Uh, I think it was even in Sunset Magazine. I remember pictures of it because there's a person reading a book because the light was so good. Um, and that, yeah, you could use it for actually storing water and, and use it indoors for heating and cooling. Yeah, there, uh, that is not what I would have chose. No, I don't wouldn't use it for that at, if I were to do a water wall. He's still pushing me to do the water wall. I, I would get an opaque one because the problem with the clear is that no matter what, algae starts growing. Yeah, it and wasn't clear. It was it was opaque. I mean, um, uh, sort of frosted looking. Yeah. The ones that I've in installed have been galvanized and they've oh. essentially been been um, ovals much like Ellen's stock tanks except they've been six or seven feet tall and in the neighborhood of 500 to a thousand gallons of water storage capacity and sort of stack them together they were for <laughs> most of us mere socioeconomic mortals um, a little cost prohibitive um, the last time that I put some in more recently during the pandemic era of pricing um, the 700 gallon corrugated ones, which are basically seven feet by seven feet um, by 18 inches deep in sort of an oval galvanized profile. And they're beautiful. Um, they were like $4,700 or something wow. like that a piece, which was kind of insane. Um, but um, I imagine that there are plastic options like um, that are, yeah. as you're, like you're talking about, Kristen, which yes. are, uh, you know, a, a high quality injection molded plastic that's UV resistant um, that are way more 
cost effective. Um, and as Bart was talking about, the temperature modulating, you know, effects of a large body of water are not to be under undervalued. Like um, the, our whole sweet microclimate that we have is because we have the ocean and the bay right there to modulate right. the temperatures for us as far away from the equator as we are. Um, and as we in the Ruth Bancroft Garden know, as far as farther you go, or you, Kristen, as farther you go away from that water, the more extreme, you know, stuff gets uh, in greenhouses, um, you know, on low cost situations where maybe where electricity isn't available or propane isn't, isn't, you know, a good option. Um, people often fill large drums with water um, to help try to keep the greenhouse warmer because during the day they sort of the water absorbs radiant energy. And then over the night it radiates it back out and it can kill how modulate things. And, you know, as our climate gets more extreme one way or the other, it could probably help keep you a little bit cooler. If you put your water walls on the, you know, west, western or southern side of your house, you probably, uh, you know, do yourself a little good there, there too. Yeah. Okay. And if you do go back and look at some of the village home stuff from the 70s, that is what they were doing. I mean, it was pass, it was considered passive solar. Um, and that we do have large water storage tanks here at the garden uh, that we use year round. Okay. And don't forget the advantage of rainwater versus, I've got East Bay mud, but everybody uses chloramine. And I, don't, I just, I, if it kills the fish, it's probably not 100% even good for us, but you know, there are trade-offs, right? The rainwater, however, the, I use primarily in the summer on my, I have a lot of potted plants and uh, especially during the drought, I would hand water in between because we were only allowed to water three days a week and the pots would dry out very quickly. And so I would hand water them with my buckets and uh, with rainwater. They're, they're much happier with rainwater. Kristen, you said you'd um, have to siphon it out to get it going. No, no, no. I use the pumps and that pushes the water oh, okay. into the tanks. Okay. But what you've got to be careful of is when you disconnect things mm -hmm. that since on the, on the right hand picture, if you look, the pipe is a, much lower and yeah. that would start siphoning like crazy. Gotcha. So you have to cover it, cap it. And you can't, you have to remember to do stuff like that. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Clarification. Yeah, and the other thing I would mention as far as the treated water if you are at all interested in lichens, mosses, mm -hmm. and other bryophytes, um, yeah, you definitely do not want treated water. And that uh, we use our untreated water extensively um, and pretty much only uh, in our redwood section of the garden, where again, um, mosses are an integral part of that ecology. Hmm. Good to know. Okay. Anything else? Thank you, Christian, for uh, Kristen for um, sharing that with us. Actually, I thought I had more slide. I wanted to follow up with what Bart just told us. Um, so, Bart, do you um, have a pump that you use water from your creeks um, or underground? Yeah, it's we have a solar operated well uh, that pre exists the garden. It actually was part of our, I'm sure it was at some point part of East Bay Mud because uh, all of these uh, ridgeline parks were part of the East Bay Mud watershed lands. Uh, that then were being sold off when East Bay Mud got the water rights to the McCallamy River as being excess land. And so, and then the park district came into existence and, and that it was, I think during the, what? I'm not sure when uh, Steve Edwards decided to start using that water, but it was always used for our, um, just for filling our pond, uh, which is a new breeding ground, a fairly major one. And so um, it was several years ago, I thought, well, we're not making good use of this resource that we have. 
And with the droughts and everything else, we should be storing this and actually using it for the benefit of these other organisms that we can grow in our redwood forest collection. Uh, so that's what we've been doing and that it can be used gravity flow because the tanks are right along uh, Ansview Road at almost the highest point on our property. Um, but we actually installed a small pump so that we can actually operate sprinklers off of it uh, in our redwood section. Great. Okay, so um, I think that's everything. Thank you so much, everybody, for um, participating and joining into the meeting, and especially the speakers for taking their time to uh, give us some insight on to how they're dealing with all the water and all the wind. Um, next month, um, so we didn't have a plant forum this month, so a few people um, sent in some items, and we will have those in the uh, February plant forum. And then um, Bart is the... I didn't see the um, seed exchange list on the website, is it? I don't think it's up yet. I know I still haven't gotten back to Dave with all of the things that I'm providing. Okay. That's so, not true. That's not true. It's up. Oh, it I, is think up? I ordered it. The newsletter went out and they said the seed exchange was on it and I ordered seed from it already. I looked for it earlier today. I couldn't find it, but okay. It's in your newsletter that came out about this meeting. It's the last like three or four pages of the newsletter. Oh, yeah. so it's there. Okay, so it's not on the on the website. It's in the newsletter, right? All right. I'm sure we will put it on the website. But yes, it's look on the on the other one. Well, the newsletter the must be on bulletin. There. Okay, yeah. terrific. Thank you for that. That was helpful. And then uh, Bart, you want to talk about the um, meeting next month? Yeah. Well, we're going to have sort of a continuation of our changing climate. Uh, with uh, Paul Bonine of Zero Nursery in Portland. He's a real climate geek and uh, has done a lot of studies based on the heat dome over the Northwest. Uh, when was that now? Is it now two years ago? Uh, but that it, it really did some amazing things to plants. <coughs> I mean, causing some conifers to defoliate. Um, so we're a couple um, of years out. So we're a couple of years out. So we can get some. Yeah, um, but, but again, yeah. a lot of the stuff was fairly instant. Um, and and again, he's a very good plant person and uh, very observant. So we should get a lot of interesting stuff because. We've gotten our one day heat domes like we did this year uh, or last year now. And that uh, two years before that, we had like one week of weather uh, that was extreme. And then I do remember when we reached 109 here at the Botanic Garden in a, on a day in September about four years ago now, was just before the pandemic. So yeah, uh, dealing with these extreme heat events is something else that we're all going to have to deal with. And for those of us, or for those who do not just have drought tolerant uh, and native type plants, uh, I'm sure there will be some interesting um, ideas and things put forth at this meeting on the 20th. Look forward to that. Thank you, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you all very much. Yes, thank you everybody for- Yeah, thank you to all of the speakers. Uh, mm -hmm. Was just right. Good night, everybody. Good night.